Welcome back, boils and ghouls. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, please hit that like button. Think about sharing these videos with your friends. Get in that comment section below and let me know. And if you really enjoy what you see, Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you want to help out the channel, use the links in the description below to pick up your copy of Squadron Supreme today. But now it is trivia time. The comic industry has seen some truly strange stunts, none perhaps stranger than the inclusion of human remains in their production. And this hasn't just happened once. KISS had some of their blood mixed in with the red ink of their eponymous Marvel debut issue back in the 70s. Stan Lee got in on the action, or at least his blood did, when his DNA was infused with a run of limited edition signed comic books, which happened to be after he died and may or may not have been produced using stolen blood. Yeah, guys, it's just another story for another day, and if you want to learn all about it, get in the comments section and sound off. With all the stunts that had been pulled over the years with comics, though, industry veteran and avid lover of all things comic books, Mark Grunewald was not to be outdone. Taking it a step further, Grunewald literally had himself turned into a comic book. To learn all the titillating details about how Grunewald got Marvel Comics to publish and distribute his remains after he died, tune in for tonight's dastardly tale of trivial trauma, a little video documentary I like to call Mark Grunewald's Squadron Supreme Human Remains Edition. Mark Grunewald is a name that some viewers might not necessarily be super familiar with, but you should be. Chances are if you read Marvel Comics in the 1980s, Mark Grunewald's name was in at least one of the books that you picked up every month. His legendary runs on Captain America and Quasar are only now beginning to really be appreciated some 20 years after his unfortunate passing. Mark Grunewald was not only an extremely talented writer, but an artist as well, and a loyal fan of comic books who obviously loved the medium deeply. An enthusiastic and energetic man known for his practical jokes and crazy physical stunts, many Marvel staffers still recall Grunewald often literally cartwheeling down the halls of the Marvel offices, where he spent the entirety of his professional career. For a man that spent so many years in editorial roles, it is shockingly difficult to find someone who has a bad word to say about the guy. Even before Grunewald joined Marvel Comics in 1988, initially as an assistant editor, he was a massive fan of the industry. Born in 1953 in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, Grunewald wrote for and even helped publish several fanzines in the 1970s, including the official DC fanzine The Amazing World of DC Comics and his own fan publication Omniverse. Omniverse concentrated specifically on exploring comic book continuity, a subject that interested Mark Grunewald to no end, and one that he would become an unmitigated master and even patron saint of one day. After only four years with Marvel in 1982, Grunewald was promoted to full editor status and overseeing What If, Avengers, Iron Man, Thor, and Spider-Woman as an editor, as well as providing fill-in art for issues when the situation arose. Despite his heavy workload, Grunewald's energy and love of the medium seemed to know no limits, and along with Bill Mantlo, Grunewald wrote Marvel's first ever limited series, Contest of Champions, published that same year in 1982. As soon as he became an editor, Grunewald also began pushing for a series of books that would act as a guide for the Marvel Universe, which would eventually become known as the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. I used to delight as a kid flipping through random issues of that series and all of its updated incarnations, learning about these weird, obscure characters and all of their affiliations and their powers. It was a great idea, and one born of Mark Grunewald's unyielding love of all comics and the characters found inside of them. His mind was apparently like a steel trap when it came to comics, and Grunewald was known as the man you talked to when you had a question about any character or story capable of recalling even the most trivial and minute details off the top of his head. 
His skill and memory in this department quickly became legend around the Marvel offices and more and more people began to seek him out when they were working on stuff. He was named the unofficial keeper of Marvel continuity in 1982 by Jim Shooter who heavily relied on Mark Grunewald to keep things straight in an increasingly confusing universe of continuities that were springing up in Marvel comics at that time. Mark Grunewald was in fact so well known for his encyclopedic knowledge of comics that when Walt Simonson was creating the Time Variance Authority in the pages of Thor, a group responsible for monitoring, keeping track of, and safeguarding the Marvel multiverses, every member of the TVA appeared as Mark Grunewald. A less than subtle nod that he was the keeper of the sacred flame of knowledge at Marvel Comics. And despite working in editorial, this inclusion in Thor was not Simonson taking a pot shot at him or because Grunewald was out to stop anyone messing with the timelines like the TVA. It was because Mark Grunewald loved comics and everyone knew it. Apparently delighting in his inclusion as the face of the TVA and his growing role with Marvel and its staff during 1986, in 1987 Grunewald accepted a promotion to executive editor and the official keeper of Marvel continuity. With his background and passion for even the most overlooked of stories and characters, there was probably no better man for the job in the Marvel Universe. Grunewald is really well remembered today for his insane run on Captain America where he stayed from 1980 to 1995, battling to bring relevance to a character most people thought of as a joke or a has-been. During his time on the title, Grunewald introduced a number of different villains, hoping to jumpstart interest in Cap's rogue gallery, which he felt was lackluster by 1985. Debuting Crossbones, Diamondback, and U.S. Agent during his lengthy run, Grunewald quickly became a fan favorite with Captain America readers, breathing new life into the character and generally making the title more relevant and interesting. Mark Grunewald also wrote a great deal of bullpen bulletins and editorials and was constantly interacting with comic book fans. And anyone and everyone who did so could instantly tell he was just as passionate about the characters and the stories as they were, if not more so. It was during the course of one of these interactions during his time on the Captain America title that according to legend, Mark Grunewald via a mega fan, most likely an early cosplayer in the 1980s, was either gifted or commissioned two exact replicas of Captain America's shields. These things were legend among the Marvel offices. I'm not talking about plastic props here. They were the real deal, metal, the whole nine yards. And this is a decade before the movie. So fabricating them had to have been extraordinarily difficult and time consuming, not to mention they had to have been expensive. Even among the top brass, these shields were highly coveted around the Marvel offices and there were constantly people trying to get their hands on what were two of Grunewald's prized possessions. Despite repeated attempts, he managed to hold on to both shields with one of them prominently being displayed in his office at all times for the rest of his career. While he would unarguably go on to leave an indelible mark on the title over the next decade, in 1986, only a year into his run on Captain America, Mark Grunewald began work on the story that is considered his magnum opus, the 12-issue Squadron Supreme limited series. Having himself successfully introduced the idea of limited series to Marvel in 1984, they were hungry for more, and in whatever spare time that he had, Grunewald set out to write a story that played to all of his strengths, especially especially his extensive knowledge of overlooked and obscure characters and stories involving even the most convoluted and confusing continuities. The Squadron Supreme had been introduced years before, but under a different name. And the Squadron Su actually, this could get very confusing very quickly. So let's take this from the top and as simply as we can. So there was a team of evil superpowered beings created by Roy Thomas and Sal Buscema for Avengers number 69 from October 1969. In the issue, it's clear that they are thinly veiled versions of the Justice League of America, and I do use the term thinly veiled lightly here. However, this was not accidental. Originally, Roy Thomas had planned to do an official crossover between the Avengers and the Justice League. According to Roy 
Thomas, he wasn't even the one who had suggested the idea, which he claims the late great Denny O'Neill had come up with while the two were enjoying a few drinks. Thomas would later state that unfortunately Denny O'Neill had either never gotten up the nerve or perhaps never found the appropriate time to ask for permission from his editors at DC, and the crossover obviously never came to be, at least not officially. Never a man to toss out the baby with the bathwater, Roy Thomas decided to proceed with the story with a slight adjustment. Instead of jettisoning the idea or illegally using DC's characters, Sal Buscema and Roy Thomas created their own stand-in versions of several of the iconic core Justice League members, dubbing them the Squadron Sinister. After their initial appearance as rather generic bad guys in the Avengers, you'd think that that was the last you would hear of a bunch of DC character ripoffs created for an intercompany crossover that never actually happened. And it might have actually gotten Marvel in some real hot water if someone at DC had really pushed the issue legally. This, however, is not the case, and the Squadron Sinister would continue to appear sporadically throughout the next few years, though sometimes it was hard to tell what comics they were even in by a certain point, as the people writing and publishing them were so utterly confused by what transpired with the characters. When they next appear, the Squadron is no longer the Squadron Sinister that was first introduced in Avengers 69. Instead, they're the completely different Squadron Supreme from a totally different Earth, Earth 7112 to be exact, I believe. The Squadron Supreme would first appear in 1971 and then again in 1975 in issues of the Avengers, but no one knew the difference between the Squadron Sinister and Supreme, and this unfortunately included the people working on the covers for the books where they appeared. While inside of the books, they're referred to as the Squadron Supreme alternate reality versions of the characters that appeared previously, the covers of both issues of the Avengers refer to them as the Squadron Sinister. If that isn't confusing enough, the Squadron Sinister actually did appear again, this time in the Defenders title throughout 1974, 75, and 76, culminating in a crossover in the pages of Avengers Annual 8 from 1978, where at the conclusion of the story, it's revealed that the Squadron Sinister has disbanded completely. It's for this and so many other reasons that the cover blurb to Avengers 141 from 1975, proudly proclaiming the return of the Squadron Sinister when in fact the Squadron Supreme were featured on the inside must have been befuddling to readers at the time and still today is insanely confusing. Does your brain hurt yet? It's okay. Mine does too. Are you starting to see why Mark Grunewald, Marvel's patron saint of continuity, was like born to write this book? The characters of the Squadron Supreme kept showing up and were actually kind of popular with fans in some cases, with one member Nighthawk going on to be a fairly regular mainstay in DC Comics in the 1970s and 80s, and another member, the Wizard, taking on the name Speed Demon and becoming a recurring Spider-Man villain for a while. Despite these sporadic successes to insert the characters in the Marvel Universe proper, it seemed like no one could wrap their heads around the insane multiple timelines alternate realities, and generally bizarre continuity that have plagued the Squadron since their first appearance in the pages of the Avengers. No one but Mark Grunewald, that is. After the success of Contest of Champions, Marvel was doing more and more limited series, while the Squadron, whatever at this point, was rotting in publication limbo. Seeing an increasing number of unique and different properties being greenlit, Grunewald began to formulate a story that would play to all of his strengths, turning the confusing alternate reality and time travel gimmicks of the original Squadron Sinister from annoying road bumps to deal with into intriguing conceptual tie-ins for his take on the characters, which would from then on forever be known as the Squadron Supreme. After an initial pitch, Grunewald was given a 12-issue limited series slated for release in 1985. The dark, gritty world presented in Squadron Supreme foreshadowed those of other seminal 80s graphic novels, including Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, which would arrive not long after, but to much greater acclaim. I love Squadron Supreme and have never understood why it isn't listed alongside important and pivotal publications of the 80s with works like Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns. 
The dystopian world of Grunwald Squadron Supreme, where the heroes are no longer heroes, feels familiar and yet totally unique alongside other contemporary classics with their shared gritty and more realistic tones. In Grunwald's tale, following catastrophic damage to their planet as a result of a battle with the supervillain Overmind, the Squadron Supreme decide that they have the power and knowledge to not only rebuild humanity, but to rule it as well. They intend to turn the United States into a utopian society by seizing control of it, and they do. While the world that they begin to forge appears to be exactly what they set out to create in a perfect utopian society free of crime, poverty, and disease, the frayed edges of the illusion quickly fall apart along with several members of the Squadron Supreme themselves. I'm not going to ruin it or give away any major spoilers, but I will say that Squadron Supreme is a criminally overlooked series in my opinion. Obviously, a lot of people are lost and turned off by the insanely confusing continuity of the Squadron themselves, while still others see only pale ghosts of the beloved DC characters which obviously comprise the Squadron Supreme themselves. These weaknesses might have been legitimate critiques on the characters before Grunewald took hold of them, but today the series is remembered by many to be a high watermark of that early 80s period along with Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, attesting to Grunewald's unmitigated success in handling the confusing and convoluted characters of the Squadron Supreme. While Grunewald only worked on Squadron Supreme for a year, it was just as synonymous with his work as his 10-year stint on Captain America or monstrous 60-issue run on Quasar, and that in and of itself should tell you something. It's not that he didn't do anything lasting or memorable with Quasar or Captain America. He did, but Squadron Supreme struck a nerve with a lot of people and I think was a series that only Grunewald could have made work. It was nearly tailor-made for him with his background and characters and continuity that only an elite group could keep track of and even accurately recall in a time before the internet. Grunewald is still fondly remembered today for transforming a backstory and continuity so convoluted and confusing that Marvel couldn't even keep it straight into a lasting franchise fondly remembered by almost everyone who takes the time to read it, even now 35 years after its initial publication. In fact, the series was so popular that in 1996, Mark Grunewald was finally contracted by Marvel to write a follow-up to the critically acclaimed limited series. Grunewald was apparently elated to work on the series again a decade down the road and told his wife Catherine Schuler Grunewald that he had the idea for years at that point, just waiting for Marvel to ask him to do it. He reportedly told her that it was going to be easy to write because he felt like he never really left the world of Squadron Supreme to begin with. Unfortunately, Mark Grunewald succumbed to a massive heart attack from an undiscovered congenital heart defect that same year before he could ever start work on the sequel to his seminal work. He was only 43 years old. Following the shocking and untimely death of Mark Grunewald in 1996, it had to be decided what to actually do with Mark Grunewald. While that might sound a little bit strange, there's a reason for that. Mark Grunewald had married his second wife, Catherine Schuler, in 1992. For one reason or another, when they were married, Schuler demanded that they both write living wills. Known for his practical jokes, and as his wife so often put it, quote, throwing himself into his work, it seems that Mark Grunewald had to get in one last prank, even if it was from beyond the grave. Upon his death, the living will, written just following their marriage, would set into motion a most curious and strange series of events involving both the living Catherine Schuler and what was still left of Mark Grunewald. According to Schuler, Mark Grunewald, quote, wanted his organs donated and then to be cremated and his ashes put into a comic book. Now, before you all sigh and mumble to yourselves that you know this one already, I know a lot of you think you know where I'm going with this, but I promise you do not. Now, there's not a lot of ink, all pun intended, out there about it, but apparently Schuler couldn't get Grunewald's ashes into a comic book, at least not right away. So, instead, she got in touch with Marvel and asked that Mark Grunewald's ashes be included in a poster featuring his beloved Marvel characters. 
Tom Bravort, who was a good friend and apparently quite fond of Mark Grunewald, agreed and helped facilitate things with Marvel. Ultimately, Mark Grunewald's ashes were mixed with the black ink for a 1996 Marvel Universe poster, at least we think so. This was not highly publicized at the time, and there's virtually no information about what poster it was or exactly when this even occurred. When asked about it many years later, Tom Bravort did say that it was indeed true that Grunewald's ashes had been mixed with the ink for a Marvel poster. The thing was, he wasn't quite sure which one anymore. Since Marvel is abominable about archiving material from their own website, the only interview with Catherine Schuler Grunewald about the subject is gone, and unfortunately was not archived or shared anywhere that I could find, at least in its entirety. I did, however, manage to discover excerpts from the interview in a CBR article after a fair amount of digging, and it did yield some interesting facts. If you put the pieces together and you begin to follow the quotes, all sources point to one place. This 1996 Marvel Universe poster, inked by Claudio Castellini and colored by Christy Shield, featuring a metric buttload of Marvel characters. It's really a gorgeous piece and might have been a fitting final resting place for Grunewald's remains if he'd married anyone but Catherine Schuler. But a poster was not what Mark Grunewald had asked for, and a poster was not what he was going to get. It really seems like Catherine Schuler Grunewald was super devoted to Mark, and especially tenacious when it came to fulfilling his last wishes. Apparently, the fact that she hadn't gotten his ashes into a comic book ate at Catherine for months, and she knew she had to do something about it. Having tested the waters with the poster, when Marvel announced that they were going to be releasing Mark Grunewald's 12-issue Squadron Supreme limited series into trade paperback a few months later in 1997, Catherine knew it was now or never. Squadron Supreme had been Grunewald's magnum opus. It was where he belonged. Amazingly enough, and I believe attesting a great deal to how much so many people liked Mark Grunewald, Tom Bravort managed to get Bob Harris and the newly formed Marvel Enterprises born out of the ashes of the formal Marvel Entertainment Group that same year as they teetered on the verge of bankruptcy to agree to not only go along with the idea of putting Mark Grunewald's ashes into the comic book, but make an official announcement about it. Marvel proudly touted that the first printing of the forthcoming Squadron Supreme trade paperback would contain ink produced, including a mixture of Mark Grunewald's ashes, talked about it in the foreword of the actual book, and even put a sticker on the cover. Today, the Squadron Supreme trade paperback Mark Grunewald story has become legend, with many people shocked to discover it's not some sort of urban myth or completely made up tale. But the weirdest thing is, that's not where the story of Mark Grunewald's remains ends. Not by a long shot. Now, this story gets kind of morose depending on how you choose to look at it. If you want to believe that Catherine Schuler Grunewald is a ghoul attempting to cash in or make money off of her late husband, I would kindly remind you that Mark Grunewald asked for his ashes to be put into a comic book. I mean, that's a little bit different. Personally, I think it's awesome. I'd have my ashes put into a comic book in a heartbeat. But let's all agree that this likely indicates Mark Grunewald had a pretty open mind as to what became of his earthly remains once he had shuffled off of this mortal coil. Just, just keep that in mind. So, while Mark Grunewald's ashes had been mixed into a comic book and a poster by this point, apparently not all of his ashes had been used. With excess ash in hand, Catherine Schuler Grunewald decided that on the 20th anniversary of her husband's death in 2016, she would set out on a small tour around the country to do something even stranger with Mark Grunewald's remains. At each stop along the tour, Schuler Grunewald would mix some of these remaining cremated ashes with ink live in front of the audience before taking out a stamp that she had had manufactured to reproduce Mark Grunewald's signature. Schuler Grunewald called it the Ashogram, and you were allowed to get up to five personalized items, quote, signed with the stamp, and Schuler would also sign the item upon request as well. After taking him on tour, mixing his ashes with ink every stop of the way, plus the black ink from a poster, plus a comic book, there couldn't have been any more of him, right?
That's great. Hey, there's more. A lot more? Much more. Woo! No, I swear this is it. I promise there's no more. But in 2016, following the conclusion of the Asha Graham tour, Catherine Schuler Grunewald, by this point 62 years old, sprinkled two scoops of Grunewald's ashes onto a newly unveiled Captain America statue in Prospect Park, located in Brooklyn, New York. There was a small gathering of people, including Grunewald's daughter Sarah, in attendance for the ceremony, but this time, no one had bothered to ask Marvel's permission. While no one messed with them, at first, according to an article that appeared in the New York Post covering the event, attesting to how big of news Mark Grunewald's remains had become by 2016, 20 years after his death. At one point, a security guard tried to get her to stop, but Catherine Schuler Grunewald was not to be deterred, completing her task of emptying out the container of ashes she'd brought with her. Now, I'd like to say Schuler Grunewald scattered the last of his remains on the Captain America statue, but at this point, 24 years later, we still might not have seen the last of Mark Grunewald yet. And speaking of which, shockingly, we have not. So that's what became of Mark Grunewald himself. But what of his famous and highly coveted Captain America shields? These things were some of the most sought after and talked about pieces of in-house collectibles in Marvel history. So what became of them, you might wonder? said no one ever. Though I've not been able to verify how this happened. After Grunewald's death, the shields, plural, passed through the hands of a number of Marvel employees in the Marvel bullpen where Grunewald had spent the better part of his nearly 30-year career. While the second shield passed through the hands of a number of individuals, according to Tom Bravort, who had been involved with both the poster and the Squadron Supreme trade paperback Ash Inclusion, he quote, inherited one from Grunewald, which he displayed with pride in his office for years. I would guess that Schuler Grunewald either gave Bravort the shield as a thank you, or Grunewald left specific instructions that the shields remain with the office and or bullpen at Marvel. I'm unaware of Bravewort's shield ever leaving the premises of the Marvel offices, even following a relocation of their headquarters. The other shield, however, began making the rounds. According to Bravewort, it became known as the quote, cursed shield. I'm dead serious. It reportedly passed through a number of people's hands, and according to Tom Bravewort, every single one of them was fired. Soon, no one wanted it, and according to both Bravewort and Joe Cusada, the cursed shield was quote, long gone by 2007, when Mark Grunewald's Captain America shield would become big news. The remaining shield sat in Bravewort's office for years and likely would have remained there appearing in publicity pictures indefinitely. However, Joe Cusada pulled one of the strangest publicity stunts I've ever heard of, and in doing so, inadvertently ensured that millions of people would be seeing Mark Grunewald on national television for years to come. The comedian Stephen Colbert, who is also a noted comic book nerd, had talked about Captain America right around the time that Marvel decided to kill him off in the comics in 2007. Cusada, always the showman, quickly cooked up a scheme to capitalize on Colbert's mention of Captain America and hopefully score some brownie points with Colbert, if I was guessing. While Time Bravor was out of the office, Cusada ducked in and snatched Mark Grunewald's Captain America shield out of the display. He quickly packed it up, stuck in a letter, and sent it off for what I can only describe as a date with destiny. On the March 12th, 2007 episode of The Colbert Report, only days after the death of Captain America, Stephen Colbert read a letter from Joe Cusada which stated Captain America had willed his shield to him in the case of his death and proceeded to bring Mark Grunewald's Captain America shield out for everyone to see. Colbert, who as I mentioned is an avid comic fans subsequently put the shield on prominent display in the background of the Colbert Report for the next seven years. It was a clever little play on Cusada's part, though I'm not sure what Tom Bravort thought of it. Then when the Colbert Report ended in 2014, with Colbert proudly brandishing the shield in the show's final moments, many fans were left wondering what would become of Grunewald's legendary Captain America shield once more. Thankfully, the shield seems to have been given to the right person, though, and when Colbert took over as the host of The Late Show in 2015, during his first episode, he actually made a really big deal of showing off the shield once again and mounting it up as a permanent display piece for the last five years on The Late Show so far. 
While his death was sad and tragic, Mark Grunewald's legacy lives on in his innumerable contributions to comics, the shield that millions of people see weekly, and most importantly, in copies of his favorite story, a story of alternate realities and confusing continuity that only Grunewald truly understood, of death and rebirth. It was the story of the Squadron Supreme, yes, but also ultimately, it became the story of Mark Grunewald, Scriptor Supreme. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I really hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you want to support the channel, use the link in the description below to pick up your copy of Squadron Supreme. As always, links to all of my digitally available sources as well as for the reading can be found in the description as well. If you enjoyed what you saw, think about hitting that like button, sharing this video with a friend, and getting in the comments section below and sounding off. If you really enjoyed what you saw, Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell to get notifications whenever I upload new videos so you never miss out on one. If you have any questions about anything I talked about tonight or you have a suggestion for an episode you'd like to see in the future, think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know. Not only am I working on a few really cool viewer-inspired videos right now, but I've learned some incredible stuff from all the amazing new faces. Thanks again for sticking with me. I really hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something and as always i really truly and honestly ask only two things keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics